Now the Heads Consortium is proud to proceed with the presentation of a high quality series of best practices. It is a pleasure to be joined by a group of such distinguished and accomplished academic leaders. All of Heads institutions are well known nationally and internationally for being at the forefront of the integration of new technologies in serving their students, specifically the Hispanic community. The HEADS Consortium has elevated collaboration to a new rank, bringing together higher education institutions from the United States and Latin America and representatives from the government, private, and academic sectors for the past 20 years. These sectors are well represented in the HEADS 2014 Best Practices Showcase, validating the importance of collaboration for the success of Hispanic students, our community, and ultimately, our economic and social well-being. It is an honor to have Dr. Nitza Hernandez, former HEADS Executive Director, at this session's moderator. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Hernandez, who will introduce our panelists and begin the discussion. Buenos dias, good morning. First of all, I apologize for my hoarse voice. I was very sick until a few days ago. So I hope that it's clear enough to handle this important panel of this morning. I'm very pleased to be here. This was my, the first institution I worked for as a faculty and a dean of academic affairs. And I love this particular theater with a lot of warm regards. So uh, thank you, Jubelkis, for inviting me to manage this uh, panel. And uh, greetings to the rest of the board members here present and the rest of um, attendees. So we'll manage this session very informally. Uh, Jubelkis and the board thought that it would be much more important to have like a conversation, a colloquy, about the experiences these colleagues have had in their um, current activities at their own colleges instead of doing a very formal presentation. So um, each of these colleagues um, has a certain expertise in the topics that, of this conference. Dr. Jane Delgado here a, is a very experienced in the area of learning assessment. And uh, Dr. Celia Cruz Johnson has been exploring and, and uh, given a lot of time in research and practice of blended courses. And um, Dr. Marva Craig has been very oriented for many years in the area of retention. So you see that each of them are highly highlighting, uh, not only today in this panel, but in their own presentations at the concurrent sessions, their own expertise and experiences and best practices. So we'll start, we'll do three sessions. They will be very brief. They will, they'll have to be very accurate and very um, succinct. Uh, in each of the topics or each of the questions, we have some guiding questions for them so that they can bring up their perspectives. So let's say, um, start with Dr. Jane Delgado here at my left. And uh, we'll ask her why is technology so strategically important? for establishing an institutional culture for learning assessment in colleges and universities serving Hispanics and other minority students. Thank you very much. I am um, very flattered and honored to be here and sitting in this distinguished grouping here. Um, let me talk about assessment for a bit. Um, I worked for many years in assessment as a uh, as Dr. Hernandez said, and, and um, what I've noticed over the years, and I'm not sure which came first, the technology or the accountability, but I think I can safely say that the era of sink or swim is over. Remember back in the day when we started college, there was not much discussion about what students were learning. There was this sense that, you know, you got there and you, well, you, you were on your own, basically. And um, if you didn't learn it, 
if you didn't have the supports you needed, that was pretty much your fault. And I still hear echoes of it, but it's, it's mostly gone. And I think those of us who are here in this room, who are administrators, understand for sure that it's over, that we can no longer hold students solely accountable for what happens in their educational process. You've heard it in the, the echoes of the old, the old philosophy when people say, I taught it, they just didn't learn it. I don't know if you still hear that. We do from time to time. It used to be that there was only a little bit of a concern, um, maybe just about graduation rates, because that would impact recruitment. But now we need to know about our students real time. We need to know, we need to know about them before they come. We need to know about them during the time that they're there. And we need to know what happened after they left or what's happened at the end. This is the formative summative piece. Where we are right now is we're really good at the after. We're good at the summative data. But it's technology that's going to allow us to really get a grip on what happened to them before they came to us, what happens to them in the classroom and in their momentum track through. And then finally, what do we do with the information that we get about what's happening in all of those three time periods for them. We need to be able to close the loop. Um, we'll talk about evaluations in a bit, but I think that's what the technology will do for us. It's going to allow us to surround everyone in our environment with data about all of those periods and student progress and success. Good morning. Or, uh, Jane Delgado. Uh, now let's ask uh, Dr. Celia Cruz, uh, why would you think that technology is so strategically important for designing new distance learning environments that can impact on retention and or learning assessment of Hispanic students? Okay. Good morning again. Um, as you know, more and more adult students are coming at our doors at community colleges, four year institutions as well as young students, many of them work. So the amount of time they spend on our college classrooms is limited. They have many responsibilities. And this includes uh, particularly Hispanic students. The institution I work for has a, a Hispanic population at least of 50%. The other 50% is based on Asian, Caucasian, African Americans. But in order for us to address and help the student population, um, we understand that technology is important because it's a venue. It allows the students to come to class one day a week where they can take the other class, class meeting online or they can take online courses fully online. Through technology, the instructors are able to monitor um, the students' participations, students' attendance, and they can also monitor whether or not the students are failing. And for technology, we also use the early alert system where we work with counselors, bringing uh, counselors in contact with our students. So technology is key to those in the classroom. And I heard yesterday um, Dr. Rivera said that the classroom is a world of technology. So there are college institutions are the world of technology because technology is part of everything, everything we do particularly in the classroom. Um, technology allows us instructors to communicate with our students, whether it is through email, whether it's through text messaging, smartphones. Um, so in other words, technology is impacting anything in every way that we're doing in the classroom, whether it's teaching them, whether it's leading them, whether it is trying to make sure they remain in the classroom, whether it is trying to assist them to persist and successfully complete the course. And when it comes to learning assessment, many of our assessments now are being done online, whether it is a quiz, whether it is uh, our initial assessment tool the college are using, such as Compass. Uh, everything is being done through technology. So I, I think it's very important. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Zalia. Um, Dr. Marvak, 
Craig, um, why is technology then so strategically important for improving retention of Hispanic students? Okay. Uh, first of all, you know, <clears throat> we got this award at the time that they're giving out the Oscars, so I must take a moment to <laughs> thank you very much and um, to my colleagues. I know you presented, you sent in very lovely ones, and I'm sorry you didn't win. And <laughs> we're up here right now. And so, you know, I have something over Oprah right now. She didn't get nominated. I got an award. It's about time we have something over her. And please don't play the music on me because I took some time to thank them, okay? Okay. So, it is a known fact that Hispanics continue to be the largest growing population in the United States. However, the little known fact is that they're the largest group enrolling in college. And we found that out in 2012. So when Last year, in 2012, when I had an opportunity to engage some of our Latino students, I was so happy to share the news with them. But the news that I was saddened to share with them was they didn't graduate at the same rate as their white colleagues. As a matter of fact, now that the Hispanics are enrolling at about 69% compared to whites at 67%, it is sad though that ages about 22 to 24 of whites, they are in fact graduating students at that age group is about 22% compared to Hispanic students throughout the US. So that's one of the very sad parts. So we can blame the, the language barrier, we can blame economics, we can blame the politics in their country or the US. You know, we can play that game. But one of the things that we can look at and say, this is also increasing with the Hispanics enrolling in college is technology. And there was some research done on that as well because between 2009 and 2012, there was an increase by 14% of Hispanics now owning cell phone and also an increase in them having access to the internet. You played the music on me? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but she was nervous about doing it too, so that's okay, that's okay. So, some of them have no access to the internet still. Some of them have ac access to the internet only at school, and some of them have access by telephone, a little bit by telephone, so they're dependent on the colleges to provide this for them. And as we design and use whatever technology we have, we have to bear in mind that there's a cultural difference in how technology is used and assist students accordingly. Interesting points, all of those in the first round. Let's go to the second round about best practices and lessons learned. And Dr. Delgado, what types of technological systems or automated solutions have been proved to be most effective or a best practice for establishing assessment programs and strategies at institutions serving Hispanic students? And of course, we would like to hear your best practices. Well, we've, um, we're actually very lucky at the Borough of Manhattan Community College to be part of the CUNY system, the City University of New York. City University of New York has made us all very data rich. They provide annually a set of key indicators to all the colleges, so we're, we're pretty focused on the milestone and momentum indicators that show how students are progressing through our college. The issue for us is that 
those are not often disaggregated. And we've begun to do that within our own college to really try to narrow down by profile group, ethnic and preparation kind of profiles, what it is that our students need and when do they need it. So along with the encouragement that we give our faculty to really think about student learning outcomes and to, it's almost unavoidable now for them that somebody's gonna be showing them data, talking about data, hopefully providing tools that will allow them to look at their student progress. But it's really now um, something that we really try to communicate as often as we can that not all our students come with the same level of preparation. The, the interesting thing that we've discovered in our evaluation studies is that preparation is not, um, is not the thing that determines what's going to happen to you. We find students who come in with lower levels of preparation and within a semester or a year, all of a sudden they're excelling. They know better. So it's not about what chances you've had up to now, it's what happens when you get there. If you've identified yourself as a scholar and you've done well in high school, even if you, can't, you were shortchanged and you weren't highly prepared, our expectation is that you're just gonna jump in and catch up that, and we're gonna help you be able to do that. So we provide those tools for faculty, we provide those tools for administrators, Every level of the college now is looking at data, and I see the culture shifting. They're asking for more. I need to do a survey. I need to do an assessment. I need to do an evaluation. So at the program level, at the summative level, we're, we're just zooming ahead. We still have challenges, and we'll get to that soon. Thanks a lot. Dr. Cruz. Uh, and in your case, what, what types of um, technological systems or automated solutions have been proved good for distance learning? Okay, although we're located in the heart of Silicon Valley, our, our college district is, um, we've made some discoveries. We've been using technology for quite some time. But as you know, technology seems to be like a revolving door, too. There's always updates, changes, and so forth. So as a two-college district, it's been hard for us to keep up to date with the iPads, uh, nanotechnology, and so forth. However, we've tried our best. We provided, uh, through special grants, we provided laptops for those students, just like Dr. Craig was saying, that Hispanic population was one of the lowest with internet access and so forth. We provide a laptop loans. We have a grant now. We purchase some iPads, loaning them to students. Um, we have created online tutoring programs for our students who are taking online courses. And through student services, we provided um, chats, chat with the counselor. Students are able to email questions directly to the counselors. We have PowerPoints related to financial aid in case the students cannot attend financial aid workshops, they can view the PowerPoints online. We've learned some lessons. We've learned that we switch from multiple learning platform systems, learning management systems, but we learned that so far Moodle has been our best adoption. We've gone through several different versions of Moodle. So before we launch this semester, spring 2014, into Moodle 2.4, the college wise up and said, okay, before we send it out, roll it out to the whole college, let's pilot it with a group of 10 faculty members between the two colleges. And we just did that pilot in the fall. So we were able to work out the kinks that 2.4 had before it rolls out to the college um, population. So again, we're learning it's been a best practice to continue working with Moodle because the money that was spent on that is being redirected for other areas of technology. Um, we are still in the process of trying to get all of our faculty on board to use the Moodle shells. Many of them prefer to do traditionally lecture type of setting and shy away from anything that deals with technology. But as uh, Dr. Degado says, 
technology is not going to go away. It's there. It's here to stay. So we're trying to work with uh, change that mentality. It's been slow, like, you know, traveling on a camel, but it, we're getting there. More and more are jumping on board and uh, trying it as we move along. On the other hand, we have students who come in very technological, like savvy. I'll tell you a joke. When I first got my iPhone, it was one of my students who taught me how to deal and work with the, the phone. So again, we have those two different areas, faculty who are still learning and students who are very savvy. So we're trying to go into the, in the middle, trying to get more and more participation. But again, looking for venues to stay on board and updated with technology. It's been hard for, for us. Thank you, Dr. Svalia. Um, Dr. Cray, in your case, what would you say about all these automated solutions for retention? Well, um, I, I have to say that we, we should look at technology and make it very simple for our students. And they have the technology that we need to use for the most part. So we need to take aspects of that kind of technology for the students. And I know that people say, oh, Facebook, that's what she's up there saying. We already know that. But how the students use Facebook and how we use it are two different ways. And we use Facebook for incoming students, for example, so they become a part of a Facebook community. So they can exchange ideas and thoughts, and it's controlled in a certain way that we give them guidelines on what they may post on it, what they may say. And we also take the opportunity to teach students how to write properly on it, and offline, when they're inappropriate, to let them know as well, and what makes something inappropriate. We also use technology um, to do what we call breaking bad, breaking bad habits, right? So the students may come to us much like they may speak Spanglish, um, in New York, some English, some Spanish combination, and they never really get into one language at any given time. We also understand where they are, and we use this opportunity for learning. Um, one of the things that we use that we know they like is the avatar. And the, the good thing about Avatar, and you can get it free online as well. It may not be as sophisticated as the one you can buy, but you can make your own Avatar, which we often do in the office. And the beauty of the Avatar is it can have expressions, and you can make it any shade you'd like. And the Hispanic, blacks, whites, we come in different shades. So when you're talking to any one group in Avatar, you can take the shade of ethnicity that you would like to use. And they can play it over and over again. So instead of coming to a workshop, if they miss a workshop, or if we'd like to send information out, we send the email, then you click on Avatar, and there it is talking to you. And you know, using the for example, you can give the avatar a name that is appropriate to an ethnic culture. So that makes the students um, connect readily. And it, it, the, the good thing is the multi-use of it that, that, that is there. So technology is a two-way street. We're learning from the students, and they're learning from us. And we should bear in mind that they are at the forefront of, of the teaching. And we need to do our breaking bad for them, for them to understand. Because once they have this digital record, we have to teach them what is a digital record. Because they like to post things on the internet, not knowing that after they graduate from the college, someone is looking at that digital record. So that is crucial for us to teach the students good habits with the technology that they have in place as well. Thank you, Dr. Craig. 
These have been excellent and so interesting and challenging experiences and best practices in each of these colleges. Uh, now let's, let go, let's go to the third round. It will be quicker than we thought. I'm watching the time. Um, Jubel, please, how are we at the time? Because I, I might have another, we didn't synchronize our full amount. Much is 10 minutes. Perfect. Okay, so um, let's concentrate this round on the challenges and future trends of, of each of the areas that these colleagues have been working with. Again, in um, learning assessment, distance learning, and retention. So I'm going to skip the particular address to gain some time, and you can go through. And this time I'll give you one minute as a to start and one to round up so that we can have some time to, uh, for the public to ask questions and make comments. So um, what I found, uh, particularly in higher education, is that we're very, very good at the summative. We're, we're good at the after. And we tell ourselves, OK, we, we know how things went. We have this information, we're going to use it, and the next group coming in is going to have such a, a much better time. We're going to help them with a higher quality approach. Our challenge at this point is to shift that culture away from assessment of learning to assessment for learning. We really want our faculty to make that shift in, in, in understanding that says, I am responsible for what happens in the classroom in terms of my student learning. I need to elicit from them earlier. I need to know what they're bringing into the course. I need to know where they are at any one point. I need to know what they're thinking. I need to know what they know in terms of our benchmarks and our goals. And then we need to provide the corrective feedback for them that will allow them to get to where they need to go. When we do this in a technological environment where they have almost real time, in those classrooms where there are computer interactions with software, they have almost real time information about where their students are, what they know, what they don't know, and then they can adjust instruction accordingly. That's where we hope we're going, to this pedagogically rich environment where they know what students need every time the student shows up not just at the midterm or, heaven forbid, at the final, and then it's too late. We've gone from wanting a normal curve where we know that half of them are not going to make it to being able to commit to criterion referencing where we feel legitimately everyone can get the answer and do it well. Technology is a tool that will help us do that. From my perspective, um, I can tell you that happy employees embrace better the students' needs and, and that leads to the classroom, how you teach, how you assess, and, and so forth. So our biggest challenge has been having the key players in place to make technology a go. We've been missing uh, an instructional technologist for quite some time, so the training that's been going on has been done peer-led, including myself helping others, deans helping others, and so forth. Um, so it's been challenging at some times, but it's also enlightening because we're learning that we can continue learning from each other. Um, we also need to also to look at that when the teaching assignment of a blended course or online course should be awarded to individuals who have been trained. As you know, um, most community colleges do not have all the full-time staff they need, so we rely on adjunct faculty to do a lot of our teaching. And so when it, the time for assignments uh, arrives, different assignments are given to perhaps individuals who haven't been fully trained to teach online. And if you're not trained to teach online properly, it can become a problem, including becoming frustrated with how to log in and how to upload files and so forth. Um, another challenge that we are uh, facing is that technology changes, it's constantly changing. So having the financial uh, funds to being able to upgrade and update uh, 
our equipment it's been, has been a challenge. In relation to uh, the improvement of retention and learning assessment of Hispanics on campus or as students in general, we have a challenge of this, the assessment tool we're using, which is a compass. However, we're not using a writing component to that. We're using a multiple choice um, tool. In 2014, this year, the state of California is adopting a common assessment tool. So all community colleges will be having the same assessment. Right now, some of us use one, others use different. So if a student goes from one community college to the other, we have to evaluate the previous assessment tool from the other institution or the student has to retake the assessment. Um, so we're hoping that once we have the new assessment tool, that's going to make a difference how students are placed. And as you know, initial placement in the classroom either can do wonders for students or can really turn them off. As I've encountered many students that have been misplaced and then they, oh, I'm in the wrong class. I shouldn't be in the developmental course. So it's, those are the things we'll be looking at and we hope to solve um, or improve. So as we continue to increase our retention and success rates of Latino students. One of the major challenges we find at BMCC is academic readiness. And we can all play the blame game. And I, I just want you to play along with me as we play the blame game. You have all played it too. Uh, the graduate school blames the undergraduate school for not preparing the students. The undergraduate schools four-year colleges blame the two-year colleges. Okay, your, your turn. The two-year colleges blame the? High the high schools blame the? That's right. So you know how the game is played. And, and, and then we get to the parents who blame the government and society for not providing universal pre-K. So it's, it's, it's a challenge because it's everybody's fault, but no one is responsible. And what we're left with are frustrated students who are increasing their time to graduation and the loss of financial aid. So we've put things in place like degree works for advisement where it's documented what students were told and how they were told it so it's accessible by all members of the community. We have open source, open content where we get, we vet information off the internet and we'll give it to students so that they can see different teaching styles and it will help them with their own learning styles. And we have Hobson's retain and connect where we communicate with the students and where I see all the emails that are sent to students from every area of the college so I can help to put it together. And of course, we have our co-curricular transcript which documents what's happening outside of the classroom. And I'll take this opportunity to tell you that the co-curricular transcript presentation and it's called, You Complete Me, Documenting the Total Student Experience will be coming to this theater at 11.30 today. So please join me. Thanks a lot again, colleagues. It's really interesting, all these views and perspectives for future trends, challenges that we can identify with all over our colleges and universities. So let's um, use these five last minutes for a couple of questions uh, from the public to our colleagues. Uh, please use the microphone here. Uh, there are two microphones in the halls. So you're much welcome to bring a question and raise a question or a comment from your part. is uh, 
I've, I've heard all of you basically say that there's a, a lack of funding uh, in your institutions uh, to work with uh, students and uh, enhance their performance academically. In terms of the, the new trend on bring your own device to, to switch the, fund, the funds that you're using for equipment at your schools, have you thought about implementing that bring your own device and use your own device uh, on the part of the students? I have, I teach a blended class, so I get to see the students on Tuesdays in the classroom and Thursday they work online. But when the students arrive on class on Tuesdays, either they have their smartphones, they have their mini iPads, they have the iPads, and they have the laptops. So if they're kind of say, okay, we're gonna review what your homework was online on Thursday, you have to read a selection about the kite runner and the author and so forth and they haven't done it, they, oops, immediately they open it up, quickly read it, scan it through, and then they're able to try to answer the questions. So it's, it's getting better, however, um, the socioeconomic level of the students I, I work with is very low. And so they have to determine what is most important. Getting an iPad or a laptop or helping their family pay the rent or food. So it becomes kind of a difficult situation, but some of them have better phones than I do. I can tell you that, better iPads than I do. So it, it, it works sometimes. Well, I'll be honest and say we, we currently do not have an issue with funding for technology for our students. Um, we do charge a technology fee and the technology fee is used very wisely, and it's inclusive of students' input on how it should be used. So every year we have a committee where we include our students, faculty, and staff. So technology, it's not an issue, but there's some minor things that we have done that will include, for example, if the students bring their own gadgets to the college, we have provided charging stations for them because one of the issues, of course, they'll have it, but no battery, and you'll see them in an outlet somewhere or sharing with someone. So we've, we've provided them with that, but currently the funding is not an issue for BMCC. Is there another question or comment from the public? Not really? Well, I think then we are on time, and we would like again, on behalf of our uh, interesting panel here, members, to thank you for your uh, attention here, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for all the best practices and interesting experiences that you have shared with us today. We keep on learning about how to do this much better every, every day for our students. Thank you. I would like to thank to all panel members for your extraordinary presentations. Your commitment to the Hispanic community and to the improvement of education are truly inspirational. With the presentation and discussion, we officially conclude the plenary sessions of the HEADS 2014 Best Practices Showcase. We invite you now to participate in the rest of the concurrent sessions we have today. We really hope that this event will be of great value for you and expect to see you in 2016 for the next HEADS Best Practices Showcase. Remember that we have changes in the rooms because of the construction is going on. So the room that was assigned yesterday, SM215, now will be SG003. And room SM216 will be now SJ004. If you have any doubts, go to the registration area. They will explain to you. Finally, we would like to invite you this afternoon to join us in a very special reception to celebrate the success of this event and network with our colleagues from out of town. This reception will be uh, taking place at the exhibitors area. After that, those who want, they can go to Sanse. 
Well, thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. I hope you, you had a great time. The ones that are from out of town here in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you.